golden sandy beaches, picturesque seaside villages, cliff-top walking trails with breathtaking views, historic landmarks and a fascinating history dating back millennia await you on the island of Jersey. Join us on a long weekend break to experience some of the wonderful things to see and do on this beautiful island. We'll experience the coastline's natural beauty by hiking along a few of the many walking trails, delve deep into the past by visiting two of Jersey's incredible castles and experience traditional rural life at a beautiful 15th century farmhouse. Exploring the capital St Helier, we'll admire the lovely buildings and architecture and sample some of the delicious food on offer and enjoy a famous Jersey ice cream or two at a couple of the charming seaside villages. There's a lot to pack into this long weekend, so let's get started. Jersey is about 80 miles off the coast of England and just 14 miles from France. It is the largest of the Channel Islands, with Guernsey, a little smaller, falling into second place. We descend into the island on a murky early Saturday morning. It's a quick 45-minute flight from London Gatwick. With over 20 departure points in the UK and Ireland, and one from Amsterdam, you're never too far away. There are several airlines to choose from at the time of filming. Condor Ferries run boat services from two Southern England locations and one from France in peak season. We pre-booked a car hire with Europe Car Jersey, conveniently located at the terminal. Whilst expensive at £189 for three days, it was the cheapest on offer and at least it was a brand new car. Hitting the road and before heading to St Helia, we started our day with a visit to the Corbier Lighthouse on the southern tip of the island. The remnants of a short sharp shower created a lovely rainbow halo over the lighthouse as we parked up. The lighthouse is perched on a rocky tidal island overlooking the crashing waves of the Atlantic Ocean connected to the mainland via a causeway. The beacon is only accessible during low tide, so we had already checked that we could cross before heading there. Please make sure you are aware of the tidal times before walking across. An alarm does sound as a warning of impending high tide, but don't rely on that solely. The unwary have been caught out before. An assistant to the keeper of the lighthouse drowned on the 28th of May 1946 while trying to rescue a visitor cut off by the incoming tide and strong waves. Jersey's tidal range is among the largest in the world. At low tide, the island size nearly doubles, and the biggest tides of the year can reach a staggering 12 metres. The location of the lighthouse is quite striking, and many visitors are drawn here to take artistic photos, capturing an amazing sunset or ghastly storm. Sir John Coode was the designer, and it became the very first lighthouse in the British Isles to be built of reinforced concrete with construction completed in November 1873. The first beam of light flashed across the ocean in April 1874, visible for 18 nautical miles 33 kilometers. It has shown sailors the way ever since. Getting around Jersey is a pretty easy affair by car, as the island is only 9 miles wide by 5 miles high. It never takes long to get anywhere. You'll also be no more than 15 minutes from the sea wherever you are. If you're not driving, Liberty Bus runs an easy-to-use regular service linking the island's main locations and attractions with the main bus station in St Helier. Taxis can be an expensive way to move around, and there is no Uber on the island. The Channel Islands are dependencies of the British Crown and not part of the UK. Instead, they are administered according to local laws and customs. We've arrived in St Helier, the largest town and capital of Jersey, with charming shopping streets and plenty of activities to keep you busy. Having some points to redeem with Radisson Hotels, 
We left our bags and car at the Waterfront Hotel. There is of course a huge choice of accommodation options for all budgets across the island. You certainly won't be short of places to stay. The Elizabeth Marina in front of the hotel is a relatively quiet location with great views of the historic Elizabeth Castle that we'll visit later. The ferries sailing from England, France and Guernsey arrive just around the corner, so this is roughly where you'll get dropped off. Let's take a stroll into the centre, which is just a 10 minute walk away. If you need a nautical fix, there are several marinas and the old harbour to visit. You can also immerse yourself in the island's shipbuilding and seafaring past by heading to the Maritime Museum and Occupation Tapestry. The tapestry depicts life during the German occupation. You can't miss the museum due to the unusual steam clock just outside, a replica of the centre section of a paddle steamboat named Ariadne that back in the 19th century ferried passengers and cargo to and from England. I understand the steam and whistle function have been broken for some years now. Jersey was the only British soil to be occupied by German troops in World War II and crossing the road we enter Liberation Square. In May 1940 German forces invaded and during the occupation used the square for a variety of purposes. It was a place for German soldiers to gather and parade and a place for the public to hear announcements from the occupying force. On Liberation Day, the 9th of May 1945, thousands of people gathered in Royal Square to celebrate the end of the occupation. After the war, the name was changed. It was rebuilt and landscaped. The Liberation Monument was erected in the centre of the square in 1995 to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Liberation. The statue symbolises Jersey's freedom. Liberty Wharf Shopping Centre is to the side of the square. Much of the site is a former abattoir which was restored and converted for use as a shopping centre in 2010 with an eclectic range of local boutiques and specialty shops along with dining facilities and cafes. It was still pretty early if you're wondering why there are not many people about. It will become a bustling town later as the influx of locals and visitors begin to embrace the day. The old St Helia railway station building was incorporated into the centre. The Jersey Railway first opened in 1870, one of two lines that operated out of St Helia. The western line ran services between St Helia and St Alban, with trains stopping at three intermediate stations along the seafront and later extending to La Courbière. In 1936 the line closed to passengers after a devastating fire at St Alban's train shed, destroying most of the company's rolling stock. Today the island has no railway unless you count Le Petit train that runs along the seafront. Just back from Liberation Square you will find the Jersey Museum and Art Gallery. It is one of the largest museums in the Channel Islands and houses a wide range of exhibits. A great place to find out about the history and culture. We purchased a heritage pass giving unlimited access to four sites for the price of three over seven days. Check out the Jersey Heritage website for ticket information and places you can visit and some free locations as well. We'll see the other attractions we visited using the card later in the video. Let's have a quick look through some of the exhibition areas. 250,000 years ago Jersey was part of a continent and the prehistory exhibits tell the story of Jersey's earliest inhabitants. The Duke of Normandy played a significant role in shaping the history and identity of the island. Learn about the self-government dating back to the last Duke who became King John in 1199. The legacy of the Duke of Normandy can still be seen today. The island's native French Norman language, culture and legal system are all influenced by the Normans. The story of everyday life over the centuries can be seen in the social history exhibits. From farming and the cultivation of its best known product, the Jersey Royal Potato and the rich creamy Jersey milk.
Other exhibits cover the first transport system when horse-drawn buses began operation in the 18th century and the railway we spoke of earlier. Even the evolution of time-saving household gadgets has its place. Our favourite part of the museum was the beautifully restored Victorian house. The home on Nine Pier Road backs onto the museum and has been cleverly incorporated into the building. It was built in the early years of the 19th century by a successful ship owner, Philippe Nicole, and became his family home providing a comfortable life for his 13 children and wife Esther. Philippe died in 1835 and left the house to his daughter Jean. Her mother and a few of the other children remained. By 1855, Jean, aged 47, married a homeopathic doctor, Charles Giniste, a widower. He moved in with his three children from his first marriage. The home is laid out as it might have been during that period, and as we move through the rooms, you learn the story of a Victorian family in crisis. Having amassed £5,000 of bad debts, three million in today's money, the home and its contents were put up for auction but the bank feared the debt would not be repaid, so stopped the auction and seized their assets, leaving the family in disarray. One night, they abandoned their beautiful home, fleeing to France to start a new life. Heading up Conway Street, we enter the town's pretty shopping streets, with some lovely buildings to view on and around Broad Street. The Jersey Banking Company was formed in 1873, and this lovely building was built. Now the Nat West, it continues its banking traditions. Equally beautiful is the Lloyds Bank, originally built in 1873 as the headquarters of the Capital Counties Bank and a well-loved Victorian landmark for the town. Let's take a stroll down Broad Street and cut into King Street. The town hall is the seat of local government for the St Helier Parish. The building was originally built in the 1850s and is home to a variety of local government offices, including the parish treasury and the constable, one of the civic heads of the 12 parishes of Jersey, a position unique to the Channel Islands dating back to Norman times. Having seen a small slice of the centre, let's head back to the shoreline. From the soft, sandy, crescent-shaped beach, we can reach the historic Elizabeth Castle, which sits on a tidal island just off the coast of St Albans Bay. Depending on the tide, you can walk along the causeway or take the amphibious Castle Ferry which runs from 10 a.m. each day. We chose to take a ride on the ferry. The crossing takes about five minutes and walking is 25. The amphibious crossing is included in your ticket price. But as we were on our second attraction to visit on the Heritage Pass, we had nothing more to pay.
The ancient fortress has played a significant role in the island's defence for over 400 years. Its construction began in the 16th century, driven by the need to strengthen Jersey's defences against the growing threat of French attacks. Sir Walter Raleigh, governor of Jersey, named it after Queen Elizabeth I who reigned during the time of its construction. There are 15 acres to explore with some wonderful views when you climb the battlements. The main gate near to the guardhouse leads you into the outer ward which includes Fort Charles. Unfortunately there was some restoration work going on during our visit closing the Georgian military hospital and the officers quarters. In 1642 the English Civil War broke out and Jersey offered refuge to Prince Charles for a 10-week period during his exile in 1645 and again in 1649, providing him with a safe haven during a turbulent period. Charles would become King Charles II in 1660 and in 1664 thanked his loyal supporters, Jersey Governor Sir George Carteret and his partner Sir Edward Berkeley by granting them the Isle of Jersey and land in America. They named the new colony New Jersey after the island of Jersey. You'll notice a large number of cannons strategically positioned around the castle. At its height, 64 protected the fortress. If you are here at noon each day, except Sundays and public holidays, you can see and hear a cannon being fired by a period costumed soldier marking the time and to commemorate the Battle of Jersey. The Battle of Jersey was a brief but bloody conflict that took place on the 6th of January 1781 during the Anglo-French War and the American Revolutionary War. A French force supported by the newly formed United States attempted to invade the British rural island to eliminate the threat it posed to French and American shipping. Jersey provided a base for British privateers who preyed on the French and American merchant vessels. The battle took place in Royal Square and was unsuccessful. This part of the castle is the Lower Ward, first built between 1626 and 36, but altered in the 18th century. In its centre is the parade ground and the buildings around it are where the soldiers lived and trained. There are exhibition rooms, a cafe and toilets in this area. You can also visit a bunker built in 1943 by the Nazis during the occupation. Around 100 German soldiers stayed in the Elizabeth Castle until Liberation Day. This was the governor's house where Sir Walter Raleigh briefly stayed. Among the many captivating landmarks on this little island is Hermitage Rock, seen in the distance. A secluded inlet shrouded in legend and steeped in spiritual significance. It was here in the 6th century that a devout hermit is said to have sought refuge from the relentless persecution of his Christian beliefs. Elia or Heralbert, as some call him, was said to have been born in Belgium and fled to Jersey to live a solitary life on Hermitage Rock where he prayed, fasted and performed miracles. You can climb the steep steps up into his tiny hermitage. In 555 AD, Helier was martyred by a group of pirates who had invaded the island. He was beheaded on the beach and his body was buried on the rock. His tomb soon became a popular pilgrimage site and he was eventually canonised as a saint and the town was named after him. A Benedictine priory was built on the island 
in the location of the parade grounds in the 12th century dedicated to the saint, a thriving religious community for centuries, providing spiritual guidance and education to the local population. However, during the English Reformation in the 16th century, Henry VIII dissolved all monasteries and priories, and so it was closed and dismantled. Heading back to the castle, we can climb up the lower keep. The captain's house and the 16th century upper keep are also in this section. King Charles II sought refuge here. Reaching the top, we have the finest views across the castle and around the bay. A wonderful end to our visit to the castle. It's time to return to the mainland. Having had a 4am start to the day, it was time to relax. There are numerous pubs to frequent. The lamplighter caught our eye for a swift pint or two, before heading to Aromas in St Helier for a wonderful three-course meal. We didn't manage to get pics of everything, but the food was amazing and under a hundred pounds with a bottle of wine. Guernsey may be smaller than Jersey, but it still packs a punch with stunning scenery and attractions. Join us after this video as we take you on a gorgeous Renoir walk, explore St Peterport and a number of other historical attractions. If you like Jersey, you'll love Guernsey. Day two of our trip takes us first to the small quaint fishing village of Gorey on the east coast of the island. Catch a bus from St Helier or take the 15 minute drive as we did. On the way we pass one of the large number of defensive towers built all over the island in the 18th century to protect the islanders. We'll pop back and see this one later as it's in a very pretty location. Gori is a charming seaside village popular with tourists for its relaxed feel, colourful buildings and floral displays. Lovely sandy beach and fishing harbour, all overlooked by the imposing castle that sits proudly above, once protecting this side of the island and where the Nazi flag was flown during the occupation. With a lovely fishing harbour, it's big on seafood and several good restaurants line the Gory Pier. So take the opportunity to explore and check menus for lunch or dinner. All the fish and seafood will be locally caught, so you really can have the catch of the day. You'll find the first Jersey Royal potatoes of the season are hand-picked from the steep castle-facing fields and oysters are grown in abundance just off the coast, as has been the case since the 1800s. The 17th and 18th centuries saw Gory emerge as a bustling maritime centre, with shipbuilding yards lining the waterfront. The villagers harbour played a vital role in the island's trade. In the early 19th century, Gory experienced an oyster boom, with a thriving industry employing hundreds of men. The village's oyster beds yielded some of the finest oysters in Europe, attracting demand from across the continent.
Mont or Guy, also known as Gory Castle, played an important role in the Nazi occupation, but its history and past predate that period by several hundred years. Let's use our heritage pass and visit this impressive castle. We first need to climb behind the shops and find the entrance. Montorgai was well placed to defend, with cliffs on three sides and the sea on the fourth. In fact, the castle was positioned on an Iron Age fort. Construction can be traced back to 1204, at around the time that the French King Philip II Augustus took Normandy from King John of England. It was important for the English King to defend his territory, and so the building of the castle became a priority. A formidable fortress overlooking Gory Harbour, the castle became the primary defence against French incursions, serving as the residence of the Jersey governors until the late 16th century, when Elizabeth Castle was built and took over as the primary defence. By this period, the development of gunpowder and cannon technology had rendered the castle virtually indefensible from Mont Saint Nicholas, the adjacent hill which overlooked the castle, and susceptible to attack from ship mounted guns. It continued to be used as the island's only prison until the construction of a prison in St Helier at the end of the 17th century, when it fell into decline as it wasn't really needed anymore. Some repairs were carried out between 1730 and 34, and for the rest of the century, parts of the castle were adapted for garrison accommodation before another decline. You really can lose yourself in the labyrinth of walkways, corridors and rooms but eventually you'll find your way to the top after some 200 steps. The views are incredible, possibly the best on Jersey. You really can see why this was the perfect spot for a castle. We are now driving along the A4, which is the coastal road between Gory and St Helier. We'll pop back to that tower at La Hoc. The glistening sea caught our attention on the way out. The beach at La Hoc is mainly rocky with a few sandy areas. As the tide goes out, rock pools appear, so there are opportunities for winkle picking and shrimp catching close to the shore. The tower on this southeast corner of the island was built around 1780 as part of a series of coastal defence towers ordered by the then Governor of Jersey. It is a three-storey structure made of granite with a spiral staircase leading up to the top. The ground floor was used as a magazine for storing gunpowder and ammunition, while the upper floors were used for accommodation and observation. Equipped with a number of gun ports, the tower played an important role in the defence of Jersey during the Napoleonic Wars. In 1781, the tower was attacked by a French force and the defences successfully repelled the attack. The tower continued to be used as a defensive position until the early 19th century. It's a nice little corner of the island to watch the world go by or have a beer in the nearby pub. We're driving inland now to step back into rural life at a traditional 15th century house and farm. The roads are a little more windy and narrow, but the scenery is lovely.
Arriving at Hampton Country Life Museum, there is a decent sized car park. Bus Route 7 from St Helier to the Three Oaks Garage, a five minute walk away, is the nearest bus stop. This is the last of the four attractions we picked on our Heritage Pass. The museum consists of three main buildings, all named after past owners. We start in the oldest, the Hampton House, dating from the 15th century. The house is laid out as it might have been in 1660, when Lawrence Hampton and his wife Philippine lived here. This is the kitchen, used for cooking, eating and possibly sleeping by the household staff. Some of the furniture is made from oak, either locally sourced or imported from France and England. This is a coffer used to hold linen or clothes. Benches and stools surround the table as chairs were for the masters of the house. A storeroom kept items as fresh as possible, with meats being salted to preserve them, foods hung from the ceiling to keep them out of reach of rodents. A dining area for the family. The home was extended and transformed a number of times. A second storey was added in the 16th century, and another two-storey extension was built at the end of the 17th century. The chambers upstairs were bedrooms and living spaces for the family. Beds had curtains for privacy and warmth at night. Mattresses made from feathers, wool and straw. Fireplaces were in each room as this was the only form of heat. They also provided much of the light at night, with a few candles and oil lamps dotted around. The architecture of the Long Loire house is apparently similar to that in medieval Brittany. The rooms below were used for the livestock. We can see a few young Jersey calves in the barn. The rooms above were used for the family. There was a demonstration of yarn making going on. But it was pretty hard to film in just the candlelight. Behind the buildings are further areas with livestock, which will be a firm favourite with the children. Meet the sheep, Hello. pigs, yeah. and chickens. The northern yard was built in the late 19th century and contains a number of outbuildings and rooms needed for the labourers. It contains a stable and carriage house. Horses were the common form of transport then and needed to plough the fields and get around the island pulling carriages. A bakehouse to bake bread, a staple and cheap food. A wash house to clean and dry the clothes of the workforce. And an example of a farm labourer's accommodation and basic sleeping area. Many seasonal labourers arrived from Brittany to help on the farm and with the harvests. These exhibits give us an idea of the living conditions at the time.
Cider used to be the island's biggest export well before the arrival of the Jersey Royal Potato. The original cider press can still be seen, it's used in demonstrations and to produce a small batch you can buy in the farm shop. The quality of both Jersey apples and cider were held in high esteem in France and the UK, but the industry eventually went into decline and only a handful of orchards remain today. They were felled to make way for growing potatoes, a crop with a more consistent yield. Sivret House was built on the site during the 1830s, the most recent building on the farm. It's been laid out as a post-war farmhouse, giving us a sense of life after the German occupation. After the liberation, there was a period of rebuilding and recovery. The island's economy was in ruins, and there was a shortage of food and other essential supplies. However, the people of Jersey were determined to rebuild their lives, and the island quickly began to recover. Many of the islanders have donated objects and furniture to enhance the displays in this house. For an afternoon walk, we headed to the Devil's Hole on the north of the island. The number 7 bus route from St Helia also stops here, it's about a 40 minute scenic bus ride. There is a car park that is shared with the Priory Inn, a pub and restaurant. The walk down to the Devil's Hole takes about 15 minutes and is not recommended for those with mobility issues. We pass the striking form of the Devil in a sculpture very early on in our walk. As the weather had been pretty bad in the weeks leading up to our trip on the August Bank holiday weekend, much of the walkway had turned into a stream and we could have done with our proper walking boots. Nevertheless, the walk is rewarding as you arrive at the coast and the steps that lead down to the viewing platforms offering stunning views of the coastline. The rocks behind the cliffs slumped and created a shelf, which due to erosion created a blowhole. No one is really sure how the area got its name. An information board speaks of a shipwreck where the figurehead of the vessel broke off and washed up in the blowhole. Arms and legs were attached to it to make it a devil-like figure, but who knows if that's true. Still, it's a nice spot to enjoy the coastal views and for an energetic walk back up. For dinner on our second night, we took the bus from St Helia to St Albin on the other side of the bay from St Helia. A bus 1, 9 or 12A will get you here was a grey end to the day. St Albans history dates back to the 6th century, when it was a small fishing village. The town's name is believed to derive from St Albin, the 6th century Bishop of Angers. In the 17th century, 
It became a thriving port with a bustling harbour and a flourishing trade in goods such as wine, salt and textiles. The town's growth was further fueled by the arrival of Huguenot refugees from France who brought with them their skills in shipbuilding and the textile industry. If you want to find a quieter atmosphere to St Helier of an evening, then there is a number of pubs and restaurants to pick from. We chose the Salty Dog Bar and Bistro for dinner, which was a popular place to eat. We shared seared scallops, crispy pork belly and quince alioli for starter. We all had mini beef fillet and seared king prawns. And I had char grilled prime Irish sirloin, seared scallops, and king prawns. It was just over £100 with two rounds of beers, a delicious meal ending our second day on the island. Our third and final day had arrived, and it wouldn't be a full one as we needed to catch our flight home. Jersey has many walking trails, and we started our morning by driving to Beauport Beach for a walk along the coast. Some winding roads and a few tight manoeuvres led to a small car park above the beach. You can walk down to the sandy beach from the car park, but we kept to the cliff path above. It's a pretty easy walk, and as you hug the coastline, you get great views of the cove, sheltered by towering cliffs, creating a sense of privacy and seclusion. It's just one example of some of the wonderful beaches available around the island. A hidden gem, but not a secret. The water is crystal clear, inviting swimmers and snorkelers to explore the underwater world, and today a few kayakers on a trip out. You can walk along the coast from here pretty much all the way to Corbiere Lighthouse that we visited right at the start of our weekend. We have spoken about Jersey during World War II a few times, but one of the most significant and impressive sights on the island is the Jersey War Tunnels. We are following the number 28 bus right now to the museum. The tunnels offer a unique insight into the lives of those who lived through the occupation. And if you want to truly understand what they went through, this is a must visit. Information on the seasonal opening times and current ticket prices are available here. Bus route 8 and 28 will get you here from St Helier. During World War II, the Crown left Jersey defenceless and the island became occupied by German forces. The tunnel complex of H08, now the Jersey War Tunnels, was built between September 1941 and October 1943. Designed originally to be a munitions barracks for stockpiling ammunition safely away from an Allied attack, later to become an underground hospital. The tunnels were constructed by forced and slave workers from nations across Europe. Part of the exhibition will explain the process of building the tunnels and shifting 14,000 tonnes of rock during the excavations. Twenty-two men would perish during the construction. Shortly before the invasion, the islanders had to make the unenviable decision to stay and face the invaders or abandon their homes taking only what they could carry and leave the island. They had 24 hours to decide. 23,000 registered to go, 
nearly 50% of the population. But when it came to it on the quayside, the sight of the crude vessels, coal, cement and flower boats put many off and in the end only 6,600 left the island. Returning home, they found their houses had already been ransacked as those staying believed them to be gone. On the 28th of June 1940, air raid sirens sounded. The Germans had arrived and began a bombing campaign. Little did they know the island was undefended. Once they realized, they walked straight in. The exhibits go on to share the stories of how everyday life changed. Food was in short supply and the islanders learnt to adapt and become creative with meals. Clothes were made from curtains and shoes were rehealed with old bits of tyre, bike tyres replaced with bits of hosepipe. Some of the female islanders became involved with the German soldiers. Combining that with a notice telling people they would be rewarded for informing on others led to mistrust and paranoia amongst the islanders, with some becoming informants with disastrous results for those involved. The tunnels also housed a command centre, which was used to coordinate German military operations on the island. Equipped with maps, radios and other communication equipment, it was a vital link between the German forces on Jersey and their superiors on mainland Europe. In 1944, the Germans feared an attack by Allied forces and converted the tunnels into a casualty receiving station. Deep underground, it could safely treat injured German troops and had room for up to 500. It was fully equipped and ready for action. That day would never come and the hospital was never used. The German occupation of Jersey ended in May 1945. After the war, the tunnels were used by the British military, but eventually became abandoned. Today, they tell a unique and sobering story of life on the island during the war. For some lunch and a beach walk, we headed to Wenat Beach and St. Brillard, a popular seaside resort. We parked by Wenner Beach as we wanted to eat in the Smugglers Inn. Two fishermen's cottages reputedly built around the 13th century converted into a tavern and lodgings, the name harking back to the days when contraband might have been brought ashore here. It was a quaint place most of the original granite work, beams and fireplaces have been retained inside. I can imagine a cosy atmosphere on stormy cold nights. The food was standard lunchtime fare, with Will having a lasagna and I picked a burger. At just over £30 with a beer each, it was very reasonable. To work off our lunch, we walked along the beach heading to the popular resort of St. Brillard in search of a Jersey ice cream to round off our trip. Along the way, you can see more remnants of the German defences, with this large concrete anti-tank wall preventing a landing on the beach, also seen on other areas around the island. The Victorian Resort is another popular place for tourists to base themselves outside of St Helier. 
the lovely large crescent beach with water activities and the Victorian seaside vibe draws people to visit or stay. The beach was relatively quiet for a bank holiday Monday, the sun failing to make an appearance probably the cause. There are no shortages of places to buy your usual seaside items, a bucket and spade, a blow-up ball, and what we were searching for, a taste of the rich and creamy Jersey ice cream. We didn't have much time to explore, but it certainly was a sweet place to spend some time during our visit. We've had three wonderful days in Jersey and been able to learn about its rich history, visiting just some of the heritage museums and finding out about the difficult period the islanders endured during the occupation. We've explored some of the beautiful towns and seaside villages, all great places to base yourself on a visit. The walking trails and the delightful sandy beaches provide a relaxed and laid-back atmosphere, making it the perfect place to escape the hustle and bustle of everyday life. We hope you've enjoyed our tour and helpful tips to plan your trip to Jersey. Remember to check out our Guernsey video as we explore the second largest island. Thank you so much for watching. Please do subscribe to keep up to date on future videos. See you next time.